welcome back. Today we're going to be looking for limit cycles. And in particular, we're going to be looking for limit cycles in uh, nonlinear systems that are put into our simple feedback um, setup. So uh, just as before, uh, this g here, this is a, the transfer function of a linear system. And this is in feedback with a nonlinearity h. And we're going to try and look for conditions under which uh, this system here is going to exhibit a limit cycle. And along the way, we're going to introduce the concept of a harmonic balance and a describing function. Um, so, let's just quickly remind ourselves, what is a limit cycle? Um, a limit cycle is a fundamentally nonlinear behaviour in which a system exhibits a stable periodic um, solution where the amplitude of that periodic solution is fixed and so is the frequency. So, Linear systems, you only get equilibrium points or a continuum of equilibria, but nonlinear systems can have distinct, um, stable periodic solutions, and these are the limit cycles. So, how are we going to find limit cycles? Well, the method that we're going to present is quite uh, hand wavy in nature, um, but we're basically just going to say, okay, we have this feedback set up. Um, What's sort of the simplest way that we can capture the essential features um, of a limit cycle? So let's just assume that this signal y, this is um, going to be on roughly on the form a sine omega t. So this is a sort of a rough representation of our limit cycle where this is the amplitude of our limit cycle, and this is the frequency of our limit cycle. We're going to say, OK, let's suppose we have uh, this, uh, we have a limit cycle. It's roughly characterized by a sinusoid with this amplitude and this frequency. Let's just step through what all the other signals need to be in this loop, such that this could be roughly true. And um, this condition of stepping through and working out uh, what they need to be. And then we can just sort of tweak the A and tweak the frequency until we achieve what's called a harmonic balance. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. Um, it's probably best to just start to illustrate the various pieces. So the first thing we're going to say is, OK, if this signal Y is of this form, but what does this signal E look like? Um, is it still going to be periodic? And the answer is yes. It's probably best to just um, see that through an example. So let's just suppose that our nonlinearity H is this saturation. Um, so here we have Y, and here we have what I'm calling E. So this is our nonlinearity H of Y. And so what happens if we put in um, a sinusoid with amplitude a? Let's just say that's got height 1. Let's say this is our amplitude a. This is time. So let's just put in our, sin our periodic sinusoidal signal. So this is y of t, or our approximation of y of t. What would happen if we pass that through this nonlinearity? Well, as long as the input is less than 1, um, let's put a 1 there too, uh, the saturation doesn't do anything. So you put in a number, you get this, exactly the same number out. So until we hit the magnitude of 1, um, E of t will follow the sinusoid exactly, something like this. But as soon as we hit an input bigger than 1, well, the output's just equal to 1 then. It saturates. And so E of t will be held flat until we get something that's smaller than 1 again, and then we get the mirrored case uh, on the reverse, and so on. So this is what E of t would look like. And now you can see that, yeah, E of t is going to be periodic. So E of t is periodic. What's the simplest way uh, we can describe this? Well, any periodic function can be described by its Fourier series. Um, so we know that if y takes this sinusoidal form, then e of t can be written 
as a Fourier series. And normally you have a constant term in your Fourier series. We're going to be assuming that everything is set up in such a way that this constant term will be zero. Uh, you can generalize this analysis to include non-zero ones. It just makes, makes things more complicated. Um, so if y is a sinusoid, then e of t can be represented by a Fourier series. So it can be rep represented by the sum of sinusoids. Where A1 corresponds to our base frequency, and that's the same frequency as the input signal here. And then we have all of the integer multiples all the way up to infinity. So this, this kind of like truncated sine wave could be described by a sine a sign with our base frequency with coefficient a1, and then more and more sinusoids, and the more sinusoids we add in, uh, the closer and closer a representation we can get of this truncated sinusoid here. Um, and for our purposes, it's we're really going to be focusing in on the first um, component in this Fourier series, and so let's just rewrite things in a slightly different way to pull that out. Um, so let's just put the I'm not going to put it in yet because maybe I'll run out of space. Um, but let's just rearrange the first term a little bit. So a1 squared plus b1 squared, and then sine omega t plus tan to the minus 1. Is it um, a little b? Yes. a over b. And then plus here we have the sum from n is equal to 2 to infinity um, of everything else. So what have I done here? Well, E of t is periodic, so it can be written as a Fourier series. We pull out the first term in our Fourier series. Here's all of the others. And then we've just rearranged things a little bit. So the first term was a1 um, cos omega t plus b1 sine omega t. And this can be equivalently pulled together into a single sinusoid of this form. OK, fine. So if y of t is a plain sinusoid, then E of t has a Fourier series, and uh, this is what it looks like, and we get all of these high harmonics appearing. Uh, what else? So, what would we need to assume in order to kind of close the loop and show that um, if E has this form, that would imply that Y had this form? This is, this is the first thing that we've assumed. Now, let's assume also that G is a low pass filter. And so what that means is that this transfer function g, if you input low frequency sinusoids into, into it, they'll pass through. If you input high um, frequency sinusoids in, their amplitude will be um, attenuated so much that they're almost not there anymore. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, whenever you input a sinusoid into a linear system, you get a sinusoid out of the same frequency, but shifted a little bit. So if I input sine omega t in here, out here I get g of j omega sine omega t plus, and this is the angle of g of j omega. So the input gets scaled by the size of the transfer function when evaluated at that frequency and shifted by the argument of the transfer function at that given frequency. And if g is low pass, what that means is that when we put in this signal that is the sum of a base sinusoid and all sorts of higher harmonics, it will have the effect of filtering out um, this signal here. So what would y of t be if e of t takes this form? Well, y of t, we could approximate it because of this low pass characteristic uh, to be equal to the square root of a1 squared plus b1 squared um, multiplied by the absolute value of g of j omega. And then we just get a bit more shift uh, onto our sinusoid. So here we've got omega t plus tan to the minus 1 a over b 
plus the argument of g of j omega. And we have a minus sign here um, because e of our negative feedback um, convention sends e to minus e here. Okay, this looks promising. So under a bunch of assumptions, um, if we have a sinusoid here, it will get filtered down to give us another sinusoid of the same frequency here. So to close the loop, we would need um, to apply what's known as the condition for harmonic balance. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to introduce a little bit of extra notation. In particular, this notation is going to co correspond to the notation for a describing function. Um, and in particular, I'm just going to label little bits of um, my representation here. So I'm going to call this n of a multiplied by a. And I'm going to call this, uh, sorry, the absolute value of n of a. And I'm going to call this thing here the angle of n of a. So this quantity here, n of a, this is going to be what we're calling the describing function. It's a function of a, it's a function of the size of the, um, of the amplitude of the sinusoid that we set to be uh, y here. And what could we put in as a function for n of a to make all of this work? Well, if we say n of a is equal to b1 plus j times a1 all over a, and we substitute that in here, we, we see that this fulfills all of the expressions we need. So the absolute value of n of a is the square root of b1 squared plus a1 squared divided by a. So here we would get the square root of a1 squared plus b1 squared divided by a multiplied by a. And what's the angle of this complex number here? This is just the arctan of um, a over b. So it's exactly what we, uh, what we need. So we're just sort of conveniently relabeling relay, parts of our expression here with what's going to be known as the describing function. And now the condition to end up back here with the same sinusoid that we've put in, this is the condition of harmonic balance. So we have harmonic balance. And so what do we need? Well, we need this equation here to be equal to the one that we came in with. So in particular, we need to match the amplitudes and match the phase shifts. So that means that we need the amplitude here, which is the square root of a1 squared plus b1 squared multiplied by the absolute value of g of j omega. Or equivalently, we need um, the absolute value of n of a multiplied by a multiplied by the absolute value of g of j omega. This needs to be equal to a. So the amplitude of the sinusoid we end up with has to be equal to the amplitude of the sinusoid we started with. And we also need um, that the argument here is equal to the argument here. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that we need that the angle of n of a plus the angle of g of j omega, we need this to equal to pi, because we have a minus sign here. We don't need this to be zero. We need it to be equal to pi. And then we'll end up with exactly the same phase shift that we started with. So under these two conditions, we have what we call a harmonic balance. And then roughly, if we put in this sinusoid, all of the equations are consistent roughly. Um, and what's a nicer way of writing these two conditions here? This is that the describing function, when multiplied by g of j omega, this is just equal to minus 1. So here we see we've got to have the absolute value of the describing function multiplied by the absolute value of g. It's got to be equal to 1 because these two things cancel out. And we need the 
you phase shift to do pi, and this is equivalent to saying that the product is equal to minus 1, or as it's more commonly represented, we need g of j omega to be equal to minus 1 over n of a. And this is this thing here, this is the condition of harmonic balance. Um, and so this is sort of a very big overview of the describing function method for predicting limit cycles. Uh, what we do is we put in these trial signals, we find the corresponding uh, value of the describing function that we get out, and then provided we have harmonic balance, we'll be predicting a consistent um, set of solutions to our feedback equations that will roughly characterize the features of our limit cycle. And now we're just going to dive into all of these pieces in a bit more detail. We're going to think about what it means to compute uh, the describing function here. And then we're going to do some examples of applying the principle of harmonic balance.